Well, I think this is maybe the most important thing to know about living right now in the 21st century, that we are now hackable animals, that we have the technology to decipher what you think, what you want, to predict human choices, to manipulate human desires in ways which were never possible before. Hey everybody, welcome to Impact Theory. Our goal with this show and company is to introduce you to the people and ideas that will help you actually execute on your dreams. All right, today's guest is one of the most profound thinkers of our time. A two-time winner of the Polanski Prize for Creativity and Originality, his books have sold over 12 million copies and been translated into more than 45 languages. Sapiens, his seminal book on the history of mankind, spent six months on the Sunday Times bestseller list and also made him a number one New York Times bestselling author. His work has been recommended by countless luminaries, including Bill Gates, Richard Branson, Mark Zuckerberg, and Barack Obama. He's won a litany of awards, including the Society for Military History's Moncato Award for Outstanding Articles on Military History, and the 2017 Handelsblatt's German Economic Book Award for the most thoughtful and influential economic book of the year. Additionally, he's one of the most sought after and influential speakers in the world. He's given multiple TED Talks on hot button issues relating to the human race, and in 2018, he was invited to give the main stage keynote speech on the future of humanity at the World Economic Forum annual meeting in Davos. He has a PhD from Oxford, is a tenured history professor at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, and in addition to his many books, He's also written for such prestigious global outlets as the Financial Times, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and the Guardian. So please, help me in welcoming the man who does a yearly 60-day silent Vipassana meditation retreat, the best-selling author of 21 Lessons for the 21st Century, Yuval Noah Harari. Welcome, man. Good to have you on the show. Thank you. It's good to be here. Dude, very excited. So I've been obsessively reading your books since Sapiens came out uh, and just really, really blown away. And behind the scenes, there's a guy here named Chase somewhere who you will have to meet today mm -hmm. who has just been an absolute champion for your books internally um, because of the way that you really frame the historical and where we're going in a way that becomes very accessible for today and who we are and that I think is the cool nexus of um, 21 Lessons, is that you're really attacking how does this all make sense? How is the past inform where we are and how does where we are today inform where we're actually gonna go? Um, and as a company that's making fiction content and dealing in sci-fi and things like that, these ideas are really, really important to us for creating guides on how to be essentially. Um, and the idea that I wanted to start with is your notion of some of the things that are happening technologically become a little bit dangerous because you can hack a human. And if you could explain what you mean by hacking a human and mm. then how do we end up hacking ourselves in a positive way? Well, I think this is maybe the most important thing to know about living right now in the 21st century, that we are now hackable animals. We have the technology to decipher how humans, or, 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 or what you think, what you want, to predict human choices, to manipulate human desires in ways which were never possible before. Basically, to hack a human being, you need two things. You need a lot of data, especially biometric data. Not just about where you go and what you buy, but what is happening inside your body and inside your brain. And secondly, you need a lot of computing power to make sense of all that data. Now, previously in history, this was never possible. Nobody had enough data and enough computing power to hack human beings. Even if the KGB or the Gestapo followed you around 24 hours a day, eavesdropping on every conversation you had, watching everybody you meet, still they did not have the biological knowledge to really understand what's happening inside you and they certainly didn't have the computing power necessary to make sense even of the data they were able to collect. So the KGB could not really understand you, could not really predict all your choices or manipulate all, all, all your desires and so forth. And, but now it's changing. What the KGB couldn't do, corporations and governments today are beginning to be able to do. 
And this is because of the merger of the revolution in biotech. We are getting better in understanding what's happening inside us, in the body, in the brain. And at the same time, the revolution in infotech, which gives us the computing power necessary. When you put the two together, when infotech merges with biotech, what you get is the ability to uh, create algorithms that understand me better than I understand myself. And then these algorithms cannot just predict my choices, but also manipulate my desires and basically sell me anything, whether it's a product or a politician. And that, so that's what you're calling hacking, that you're hitting me with the right emotional message at exactly the right time based on my biometric data? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is one of the things you can do. Then you can predict, you can manipulate, you can eventually also re-engineer or replace. If you really hack a system, you really understand how it functions, then usually you can also re-engineer it or you can completely replace it. And again, one of the dangers that we are facing today in the 21st century is that computers and AI would be able to replace humans in more and more tasks and uh, maybe push millions of humans out of the job market as a result. All right, so I, I fully understand the dangers and we will talk about some of what we were talking about off camera, which is we've got this whole story called Neon Future where we're exploring that notion of what happens to what you've called the useless class when they're pushed out of the job market and what does that do economically. But going, just staying with the, the notion of the hackability for a second. So it's funny, as you were describing it, and I know you bring this sense of like, oh, there's some like real significant problems we need to take a very serious look at. And I get almost giddy with excitement because I have potentially delusional levels of optimism. I'm very open to that. No, I agree. I mean, the thing about this ability to hack humans is that it has also potentially tremendous positive consequences. And this is why it's so tempting. If it was only bad, then it, was, it would have been like an easy deal to say, okay, we don't want that and let's stop researching or going in that direction. But it is extremely tempting because it can provide us, for example, with the best healthcare in history. Something which goes far beyond anything we've seen so far. This can mean that maybe in 30 years, the poorest person on the planet can get a better healthcare from her or his smartphone than the richest person today gets from the best hospitals and the best doctors. The kind of things you can just know about what's happening in your body um, is, is nothing like we've seen so far. Yeah, no, that, that's really extraordinary. And if you had to take the positive look and say, okay, we have this ability, let's just say it's already there, we've got all this biometric data, it's kicking off, um, how would you encourage people to leverage that to empower themselves. And I'll, I'll use an example that I found profoundly interesting from your book. So you said that growing up that it was unclear to you that you were gay, mm -hmm. but that now Stanford has developed an algorithm that essentially can look at three or four photos of somebody's face mm -hmm. and predict with 91% accuracy whether or not they're gay, which seems impossible. But if that's true, the level of data that we could give ourselves about our like deepest, most hardwired desires, mm -hmm. there would be a level of clarity there that seems useful. Mm -hmm. um, how would you encourage people to use that? Well, it's a very good example. I mean, the Stanford algorithm, actually there is a lot of problems with that research and let's put it aside. But the first key message from, from that is how little people actually know about themselves. And um, one of the most important things in my life, and also in, I think in my scientific career, was the realization of how little I know about myself and humans in general. There were so many important ideas and important facts we don't realize about ourselves. I was 21 when I finally realized that I was gay, which is, you know, when you think about it, it's, it's absolutely amazing. I mean, it should have been obvious at age, you know, 16, 15. And an algorithm would have realized it very quickly. And you can build algorithms like that today or in a few years. Um, you just need to, to follow your eye movements. Like you, you go on, on, on the beach or you, you look at the computer screen and you see an attractive guy and an attractive girl and just follow the focus of the eyes. Where do the eyes go and whom do they focus on? 
should be very easy. And uh, such an algorithm could have told when I was 15 that I was gay. And the implications are really mind-boggling when an algorithm knows such an important thing about you before you know it about yourself. Now, it can go in all kinds of directions. It really depends on where you live and what you do with it. In some countries, you can be in trouble now with the police and the government. Uh, you might be sent to some re-education facility. In some countries, like with you know, surveillance capitalism, so maybe I don't know about myself that I'm gay, but Coca-Cola knows <laughs> that I'm gay because they have these algorithms. And they want to know that because they need to know which commercials to show me. Let's say Coca-Cola knows that I'm gay, and I even know it about myself, that they know it, and Pepsi doesn't. Coca-Cola will show me a commercial with a shirtless guy drinking Coca-Cola, but Pepsi will make the mistake of showing a girl in a bikini. And next day, without my realizing why, when I go to the supermarket, when I go to the, uh, uh, to the restaurant, I will order Coca-Cola, not Pepsi. I don't know why, but they know. So they might not even share this kind of information with me. Now, if the algorithm does share the information with me, again, it's, it, it a lot depends on context. One scenario is that you're 15 years old, you go to a birthday party of somebody from your class, and somebody just heard that there is this cool new algorithm which tells you your sexual orientation. And everybody agrees it will be a lot of fun to just have this game that everybody takes turn with the algorithm and, and everybody else looking and, and, and seeing the results. Would you like to discover about yourself in such a scenario? This, this can be quite, <laughs> quite a shocking uh, experience. Okay, but even if it's done in like complete privacy, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a very deep philosophical question. What does it mean to discover something like that about yourself from an algorithm? What, what does it mean about human life, about human identity? Uh, we have very little experience with these kinds of things. You know, from very ancient times, all the philosophers and saints and sages tell people to get to know yourself better. It's one of the, maybe the most important thing in life is to get to know yourself better. But for all of history, this was a process of self-exploration which you did through things like meditation and maybe sports and maybe art and contemplation and all these things. What does it mean when the process of self-exploration is being outsourced to a big data algorithm? And the philosophical implications are, are quite mind-boggling. It's interesting. So let's talk about that. So the implications you're outsourcing, the self-discovery process, to me that sounds so profoundly useful because all day the people that write into me, they're asking basically one essential question. How do I find the thing that I love? Because I tell people, you, you need to develop a passion in your life. I don't think you find it. I think you mm -hmm. develop it but they need to start from an area of, of real interest. It needs to be actually something that at a hard wiring level, they're just, they get that response. So the, their next question is like, uh, how, right? How do I get into that? How do I discover the thing that triggers me like that? And if I discover it, then how do I develop it into a passion? If you had an algorithm, something that were able to um, use the more manipulative techniques that you were talking about that Coca-Cola is doing or whatever, but give it to you in a way that can move you in a desired direction. So I'll give you a specific example that you give in the book. So talking about how, let's say there was an algorithm that knew you'd just broken up with somebody, knew that you were in the grips of heartache, because they're, they're reading your biometrics. Yeah, they're, they're watching your, your heart. In fact, give it to us. That, that example that you, you put. So the biometrics, they're reading you. The, it's the song. It knows what songs to pick. Yeah, I mean, something as, as simple as choosing music so you, you were just dumped by your boyfriend or girlfriend and the, the algorithm that controls uh, the, the music that you listen to chooses the songs that are the best fit for your current mental state. And of course, this brings up the, the question of what is the matrix? What do you actually want from the music? Do you want the music to uplift you? Or do you want the music to kind of connect you to the deepest level of sadness and depression. And ultimately, we can say that 
the algorithm can follow different kinds of instructions. If you know what kind of emotional state you want to be in, you can just tell the algorithm what, what you want and it will do it. If you are not sure, you can tell the algorithm, follow the recommendation of the uh, best psychologist today. So let's say you have the five stages of grief. So, okay, walk me with music through these five stages of grief. And the algorithm can do that better than, than any human DJ. And what we really need to understand in, in this regard is that what music and most of art plays on in the end is the human biochemical system. At least according to the dominant view of art in the modern Western world, we had different views in different cultures, but in the modern Western world, the idea of art is that art is above all about inspiring human emotions. It doesn't necessarily have to be joy. Great art can inspire also sadness, can, can inspire uh, anger, can inspire fear. It, it can be a whole palette of emotional states, but art is about inspiring human emotions. So the instrument artists play on, and whether it's musicians, or poets or movie makers, they're actually playing on the Homo sapiens biochemical system. And we might reach a point quite soon when an algorithm knows this instrument better than any human artist. A movie or a poem or a, or a song that will not move you, that will not inspire you, might inspire me. And something that will inspire me in one situation might not inspire me in another situation. And as time goes on and the algorithm gathers more and more data about me, it will become more and more accurate in reading my biochemical system and knowing how to play on it as if it was a piano. Like, okay, you want joy? Pfft. I press this button and out comes the perfect song, the only song in the world that can actually make me joyful right now. That's so interesting to me. All right, so right now, real world, you can snap your fingers and you can have one algorithm that's tied to one uh, biochemical process. In your life for real, mm -hmm. what would you want to monitor and get that feedback on? No, that's easy, I mean, uh, healthcare. If there is like something seriously wrong in my body that I don't know about, like, I don't know, cancer or something, I would like the algorithm to find that out. I don't want to wait until, I mean, the, the usual process is that it has to go through your own mind. Mm. You can't outsource it. I mean, today, when you need to uh, diagnose cancer, there are exceptions, but in most cases, there is a crucial moment when you feel something is wrong in my body. And you go to this doctor and that doctor and, and you do this test and that test until they finally realize, okay, we just discovered you have cancer in your liver or, or whatever. Um, but because it relies on your own feelings, in this case, feelings of pain, very often uh, it, it, it's quite late in the process. By the time you start feeling pain, usually the cancer has spread and maybe it's not too late, but it's going to be expensive and painful and problematic to treat it. But if we can, you know, outsource this, don't go through the mind, through, the, through my, my feelings. I want an algorithm that with biometric sensors is monitoring my health 24 hours a day without my being aware of it. It can potentially discover this liver cancer but it is just a tiny, just a few cells are beginning to, 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 to split and to spread. And it's so easy and cheap and painless to take care of it now, instead of two years later, when it's already spread and it's, it's, it's a big problem. So this is something that I think almost everybody would sign on to. And this is the big temptation, because it comes with the whole other, with the long tail of dangers. I mean, this algorithm, the, 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 the healthcare system, knows almost everything about you. So one of the biggest battles in the 21st century is likely to be between privacy and health. And I guess that health is going to win. Mm. Most people will be willing to give up 
a very significant amount of privacy in exchange for far better healthcare. Now we do need to try and, and enjoy both worlds to create a system that give us a, a very good healthcare, but without compromising our privacy, keeping the, yes, you can use the data to tell me that there is a problem and, and, and we should do this or that to solve it, but I don't want this data to be used for other purposes without my knowing it. Whether we can reach such a balance and like, you know, have your cake and eat it too, that, that's a big political question. Yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, that is very crazy and very exciting for somebody like me who definitely errs on the side of wanting the healthcare. Um, you've talked really powerfully about story, about how stories like money, which I don't think most people think of as a story, um, as being you know, these tremendous things that control all of our lives, that point us all in the same direction, that give us sort of a common code by which to live. How can people take control of the story that they tell themselves about themselves? which I find uh, to be one of the most important stories that you engage in. Yes, yeah, so our identity is really just a story which we constantly construct and, and embellish. I mean, you can say that the, the entire human mind is a machine that constantly produces stories and especially one very important story, which is my story. Uh, and different people have different, specialize in different genres. Some people build their story as a tragedy. Some people build their story as a comedy or as a drama. But um, in the end, I, the self is a story and not a real thing. And on the one hand, with all the new technologies, you get better and, and better abilities to construct yourself. But already today, a lot of the work which previously was done in the brain and in the mind of constructing my identity, my story, has been outsourced to things like Facebook. That you build your Facebook account and this is actually outsourcing it from the brain and you are busy maybe for hours every day just building a story and becoming extremely attached to it and, and publicizing it to everybody and you tend to make this fundamental mistake. You think it's, it's the re this is really me. Mm. And um, so, why is, so- Why is that a mistake? I'm actually really curious. First of all, if you take something like the profile that people create about themselves in, in Facebook or in Instagram, it should be obvious. It doesn't really reflect your actual existence, your actual reality, both inner reality and outer reality. Like, the percentage of time you smile in your Instagram account is much bigger than the percentage of time you smile in real life. And you know, you go on some vacation um, and you post the, the, the images from the vacation. So usually you're smiling in your, in your swimming suit on the beach with your girlfriend and boyfriend holding this cocktail and everything looks perfect and everybody's so envious. But actually, you just had a nasty fight <laughs> with your boyfriend five minutes ago. And then this is the image that everybody else is seeing and thinking, oh, they must have such, such wonderful time. And afterwards, like a year later or two years later, you look back and this is what you see. And you forget what was the actual experience like. What, what is the role of truth in the story that we tell ourselves about ourselves? Very little. Do you think there should be more? There should, there should definitely be more. And what would I be the outcome if we were like, I'm really gonna make sure that the story I tell myself is objectively true? It's going to be very, very painful and, and difficult. I think it is worth the effort, but it's just very difficult. We constantly, uh, we constantly edit the, this story just like the news on TV are edited and just like, you know, it's a bit like making a movie. Like you watch the movie in the cinema and everything is so seamless. Like, yeah, this is the story, it flows. And then when you actually see how a movie is produced, this is insane. <laughs> like you have this tiny bit of a scene, you repeat it 50 times to, and, and sometimes, you know, you shoot this scene, this scene, scene two comes after scene one, but actually it was filmed long before that. So sometimes you, you, you film the breakup of, of, of the lovers before you film 
the, the first meeting for all kinds of, of schedule reasons and locations. So the, the end result is completely seamless and perfect, but it is actually made up from all these tiny, in, tiny disconnected uh, bits that have been, you know, this is from here and this is from there and we somehow glue it together and it looks good. And it's the same with the story of, of our life. It's all kinds of bits and pieces and only when you tell it to yourself or to somebody else, it kind of makes sense. The cost of trying to stick with the reality as it is, is very, very high. It's very difficult, it demands a lot of effort, and it, it, it's often very painful because you have to acknowledge many things about yourself that you don't want to acknowledge them. People have this fantasy of, I don't know, going to some retreat and just taking out a week or two of, from life to really observe inside, to really explore who am I, what is my authentic self. And they have this fantastic notion that I will be able to finally connect to my inner child and I will discover my true vocation in life and I will discover all these wonderful things about me. And when you actually do it, the first thing you usually encounter is all the things you don't want to know about yourself. There is a reason that, that, that you don't want to know them. I think it's worth the effort, but it's a very, very hard uh, uh, task. All right, on that, there's so many studies that talk about the more delusional somebody is, self-delusional, the more likely they are to be happy. You've said one of the big questions as a historian you're trying to answer is, as we've moved forward as a, you know, a species, a society, have we actually gotten happier? Mm -hmm. So there is some importance, it sounds like, that you place on happiness. So why then would you want people to do that hard work of facing the realities, recognizing the things about themselves that they don't necessarily want to recognize? Mm -hmm. Is that because you think it leads to more happiness? I think that ultimately it is worth the price. I mean, delusions come at, at a very high price also. Um, and not just to yourself, but to people around you, to the world as a whole. I mean, ultimately, this leads to things like wars and like genocide and like, in, in, and, you know, I come from Israel, I come from the Middle East, so I am surrounded by millions of people who are killing each other because of all kinds of fictional stories and delusions that they believe in. So sometimes it's an important defensive mechanism. It's very difficult to live just with the raw truth all the time. But the price of delusion and the price of not being able to tell the difference between fiction and reality, it adds up. And eventually it adds up to things like genocide and war. That sounds like a pretty extraordinary price to pay. Yeah, I yeah. will agree with you there. Um, in 21 Lessons is what do we do when we're faced with being put out of work, that we are one of the useless class and we have to do this reinvention at a career level. You're living longer, your career life is 50, 60, 70, 80 years, whatever that looks like, in a time where every seven to 10 years, like it's just, it's a completely new world. What do you think the human capacity for that level of reinvention is? Well, that's a very important question. It has little to do with immortality because even without immortality, we are heading in that direction. Even if people, if the lifespan remains as it is, 80 years, um, every 10 years, you have another big shock. I mean, people, one of the things many people don't realize about the AI revolution and the automation revolution, they imagine it as some kind of one-time event. We have the big AI revolution in 2025. You have all these truck drivers and taxi drivers and doctors and whatever losing their jobs. You have a few difficult years of adjustment, and then eventually you have the new, brave new world of AI with a new equilibrium. And this is an extremely unlikely scenario because we are nowhere near the maximum potential of AI. The speed in which it develops is only likely to accelerate. So what we are really going to face is a cascade 
of ever bigger revolutions in the job market and in many other areas of life, relationships, politics, and so forth. So you have a big disruption in 2025. You have an even bigger disruption in 2035, an even bigger one in 2045, and, and so forth. And if you look, say, at the job market, so, okay, you were a truck driver, and they no longer need you, but there is new demand for yoga teachers. So you somehow reinvent yourself at age 40. I'm no longer a truck driver, now I'm a yoga teacher. It's very difficult, you somehow do it. 10 years later, no need of yoga teachers, thank you very much. We now have these amazing applications connected with biometric sensors to your body. They know exactly what you're doing with every tiny muscle as you do this posture or that posture, no human yoga teacher can compete with that, you're out of job. You have to reinvent yourself again as a designer of virtual world games. And you do it somehow. But 10 years later, you have to do it again because this too has now been automated. And even if you get support from the government and there is all this uh, education for, for adult uh, system, the really big question is again, it's psychological. Do, do we, as human beings, have the mental stability and the emotional intelligence necessary to reinvent ourselves repeatedly? And, you know, when you're 20, what you're doing is basically to reinvent yourself or to invent yourself for the first time. And it is very difficult. When you're 30, it's even more difficult, but you, sometime, but you somehow do it. But when you get to be 40, 50, 60, it becomes more and more difficult. You have more to let go of. I've invested so much in building this career, this personality, these skills. To give it all up and start again from, from a new, it's so difficult. Mm. So I don't know whether we can do it. Yeah, that is the question that I think will ultimately be forced to answer. And that brings me to education. So what do you think that if we're talking to somebody who's 18 right now, they're trying to decide, do I go to college, yes or no? Mm -hmm. Should they go to college? And if they go to college, what should they be studying? Um, that's, it's a very difficult question. The first thing they should realize is that nobody really knows. Nobody really knows how the job market would look like in 2040. So they should uh, be suspicious of all these kinds of advices by people who pretend that they know what the job market would need in 20 years. The best investment, I would say, is in emotional intelligence and in mental balance and these kinds of skills of how to keep changing throughout your life, how to keep learning throughout your life. Now, how do you learn that? That's very, very difficult. Uh, we don't have a college degree in mental flexibility. But these are the most important tools. Uh, so whatever you choose, you can go to law school, you can go to ballet school, but you should keep in mind that much of what I'm learning might be irrelevant in, th in 20 or 30 years. So whatever else I'm doing, I should also invest in developing my emotional intelligence, my mental balance, my ability to keep changing and learning and reinventing throughout my life. So maybe to give an image or a metaphor, if in the past education was like building a stone house with very deep foundations, now I would say that education is more like a constructing a tent that you can fold up and move to another location very quickly and easily. Oh, that's a great analogy. Um, so given that it's so hard to predict the future, you've talked a lot about the power of science fiction, science fiction writers. Um, walk us through that. Why, what is the role that a science fiction writer can play or storyteller, filmmaker, whatever the case may be? Uh, our lives in the 21st century, more than anything else, are going to be new technologies, especially AI, and biotechnology. And most people, their understanding of these technologies and their potential for good or for bad, it really comes from science fiction. The political system so far has done an awful job 
in understanding and preparing us for these kinds of, of, of developments, there is almost no talk in the uh, uh, political arena about AI and biotechnology. The scientific community is, of course, very deeply engaged with it, but most people don't read articles in science or nature, and even if they tried, it would be very difficult for them to understand the professional jargon and, and all the, the statistics and, and, and so forth. So the, most people actually get their education about what's coming from science fiction. And this means, at least I think so, that science fiction is now the most important autistic genre, and it should also be the most responsible. And one of the problems with science fiction is that so far it has done a so-so job. Some novels and TV series and films are really amazing in the way they explore what's, what, could, what could happen, uh, ranging like my, some of my favorites are, my, my all-time favorite is Brave New World by Aldo Huxley, which was written back in the early 1930s and I think is the most prophetic and profound. Oh, I totally understand. All right, so before I ask my last question, tell these guys where they can find you online. Uh, I have a website, ynharari.com, and uh, they can find me on Facebook and, and Instagram and Twitter and all the usual places. <laughs> awesome. My last question is, what is the impact that you want to have on the world? I want to bring more clarity to the public conversation on what's happening in the world. Um, I think that too much of the public discussion is focused either on the wrong issues or is extremely confused and, and unclear. And people are flooded by enormous amounts of information which they don't know how to make sense of. And what I, I see my mission as bringing clarity to the public discussion, especially in terms of focusing people's attention on the most important questions. I try to give some answers too, but I don't care a lot if people don't agree with me about the answers, about the solutions. The important thing, is, I think, is, is to agree about the questions. And I would end by saying that there are three big challenges to humankind in the 21st century. There are nuclear war, climate change, and technological disruption. And these should be the first three items on the political agenda of every country. And this is not the case right now. I would like it to be the case. Awesome. Yuval, thank you so much for joining us thank today. You. That was incredible. It was fascinating. All right, guys. When I say that you're going to learn just an absolute metric ton of stuff from this man, dive into his first three books. They are absolutely extraordinary. Um, you will learn so much about where we've come from, where we're going and where we are today, that it will give you the ability to look at yourself in a totally new way, to understand yourself, not even just at the operating system level, but like at the kernel level. It was so fascinating to see him walk us through that entire lineage it's unlike anything that I've read before and reading the books as a trilogy and understanding um, how they all work together is, is breathtaking. So I highly, highly, highly encourage that. And the fact that he's out there in a populist way getting people to ask these questions I think is so critical. And he threw out, go back to the beginning of this episode, he threw out some amazing business ideas without, I think, even <laughs> meaning to. But I thought, wow, somebody could actually run with these and they would be extraordinary. And that's just the way his mind works. He really is one of the most profound thinkers of our time. Dive in, he's accessible. And that is one of the most beautiful things. And remember, he's a historian. So the way that he's putting this all in context is, is truly extraordinary. And once you understand things at why they are the way they are, then it just brings a whole new ability to see through the lies, fake news, the stories we tell ourselves, all of the just natural human attachments to really come to an understanding of the way the world actually is. And once you understand that, then you can begin to move in a way that makes sense and allows you to reach your own goals. All right, if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe. And until next time, my friends, be legendary. Take care. Hey everybody, thank you so much for watching and being a part of this community. If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe. You're gonna get weekly videos on building a growth mindset, cultivating grit, and unlocking your full potential.